Hey everybody, and welcome to Space Week for Monday, November 25th, 2019. This past week, SpaceX released a slow-mo video of their recent successful Crew Dragon launch abort system static fire test, featuring eight dinitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine fueled Super Draco engines. The first crewed test flight of Crew Dragon to the ISS, called Demo 2 or DM2, is expected to launch in the first quarter of 2020. On Wednesday, November 20th, SpaceX was doing a cryogenic pressure test of their Starship Mark I orbital prototype when there was a sudden and violent rupture between the welded stainless steel hull segments. Poor Orbi experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly as the top few meters of the craft were blown approximately 530 feet or 162 meters in the air. A pressure wave propagated back down through Starship, blowing out the bottom as well. Cryogenic liquid oxygen or liquid nitrogen poured from both ends of the craft, blanketing the launch pad in a thick fog. Starship's crown landed nearby in a puff of dust. Back in September, when he gave his Starship presentation, Elon Musk stated that Starship Mark I would fly in October. Bearing in mind that Elon time is aggressively optimistic, the expected launch date was pushed out to late December or early January. After the destruction of the Mark I orbital prototype, however, Elon Musk commented via tweet that they were going straight to Mark III. There would be no Mark II flight either. There are rumors that SpaceX actually intended to push Mark I to its limit during the pressure test, though it's unclear whether they expected it to fail in such a dramatic fashion. Unfortunately, the timeline for a Starship test flight has now been pushed out significantly. In the end, though, it's better to get it done right than get it done fast. Perhaps SpaceX has a little gradatum ferociter in them as well. Ironically, Starship's crown flew higher than Starhopper did during its August test flight. Boeing's orbital flight test Starliner cruise spacecraft, the same model that recently had a mostly successful pad abort test out in New Mexico, was rolled out to the Atlas V assembly building on ULA's German-made Kamag carrier, which has a max speed of just 5 miles per hour. There, it was mated to the rocket that will take it up to the International Space Station on December 17th. There won't be any humans on board for that launch. According to ULA Chief Tori Bruno, Starliner has been successfully powered up, ground environmental control has been achieved, and integrated verification testing completed. Boeing's Starliner and SpaceX's Crew Dragon are the two participants in NASA's commercial crew program to launch astronauts from American soil again. On Friday, astronauts Luca Parmitano and Drew Morgan completed the second of four spacewalks to repair the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer on the International Space Station. Check out last week's Space Week video for more details. Ariane Space was supposed to launch an Ariane 5 rocket last Friday with the Tebow 1 and Inmarsat 5 F5 communications satellites, but they had to postpone due to a power supply anomaly in the ground segment of the Ariane 5 launch complex. They postponed again yesterday, and they plan to try again tomorrow. On the other side of the world, the Chinese Long March 3B rocket with the Yuan Zheng 1 or Expedition 1 upper stage launched a pair of Beidou 3 navigation satellites from the Zhejiang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. The Beidou Navigation Satellite System, or BDS, is China's version of GPS. It began in 2000 with the launch of four experimental Beidou-1 satellites, which were eventually decommissioned in 2012. Beidou-2, formerly called Compass, started launching in 2007, first providing coverage in the Asia-Pacific region in 2012. Then in 2015, the third-generation Beidou-3 satellites began launching. There are now a total of 47 operational Beidou satellites in orbit, with nine more planned that will provide global coverage. Just 72 miles from the Chinese border, seven time zones and almost 3,500 miles from Moscow in the far east of Russia, lies Vostochny Cosmodrome, a brand new facility that has struggled with cost overruns, delays, corruption, and worker discontent. Construction on Vostochny began in 2011 at the behest of Russian President Vladimir Putin as a means by which to reduce their dependence on the historic Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan which was part of the former Soviet Union when the Cosmodrome was built back in the 1950s. Since the breakup of the USSR in 1991, Russia has had to lease Baikonur from Kazakhstan for the equivalent of $115 million per year. Every Russian and Soviet manned spaceflight has launched from Baikonur, 
and since the U.S. Space Shuttle fleet was retired in 2011, Baikonur Cosmodrome has been the only location in the world from which manned space flights to the International Space Station are launched. With Vostochny, Putin promised to launch manned missions from Russian soil once again. The location was chosen for a number of reasons. Being a quintessentially northern country, Russia has always been at a relative disadvantage with regards to orbital rocket launches compared to the United States. The closer to the equator you launch into an equatorial orbit from, the more orbital speed you can inherit from Earth's own rotation. At the equator, that amounts to about 1,040 miles per hour, or 1,674 kilometers per hour. Cape Canaveral in Florida lies at 28 degrees north latitude, and it's able to inherit 88% of that equatorial speed. Baikonur, at 46 degrees north, inherits just 70%. Russia's only other major spaceport is Plesetsk Cosmodrome, way up at 62 degrees north, which inherits a mere 47%. Fine for high inclination and polar orbits, but not for equatorial orbits. So, Russia chose Vostochny at 52 degrees north, one of the most southern locations in Russia, where they can pick up 62% of Earth's rotational speed. This means they can launch larger payloads with less fuel. Vostochny also has a clear path to the Pacific Ocean, about 500 miles to the east. This means they can splash down their spent rocket stages in the ocean rather than raining them down on the countryside as happens in Kazakhstan. Designed to employ more than 20,000 people, Vostochny was intended to be an economic boon to the poorly developed Russian Far East. Additionally, as a civilian spaceport intended for commercial launches, being located so far from Moscow, farther than the distance from Miami to Alaska, could potentially be a factor in attracting international customers to Vostochny. The first Soyuz launch from Vostochny was back in April of 2016. In 2017, there was an attempted launch of a $41 million Meteor M weather satellite and 18 small sats from six other countries, including the United States, which failed because the Fregat upper stage had been programmed for a launch from Baikonur, not Vostochny. Oops. Since then, there have been three more launches, all successful. A second launch pad is under construction for the Angara rocket, which is planned to be ready by 2021. It was supposed to be completed by 2015. The reported construction cost of Vostochny Cosmodrome ranges from the equivalent of $4.7 billion to $7.5 billion US, depending on the source. According to an expose published in 2015, the original proposed cost was just $1.2 billion. Some of this overspending was the result of corruption, a notorious problem in that country. Up to half of the more than $50 billion spent on the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics are alleged to have disappeared due to corrupt construction contracts. The Kremlin confirmed that at least $172 million was embezzled during construction of Vostochny, and 58 people so far have been jailed, including the former head of the primary construction contractor who was single-handedly responsible for the loss of $81 million. Even as billions of additional rubles were being consumed by the project, workers at the site were not paid for up to four months at a time. They staged hunger strikes for three years in a row in protest. In 2015, 350 workers painted a giant message on their barracks, begging Vladimir Putin for help. Putin vowed to give these issues his personal attention, and salary payments did resume, but the corruption allegedly continued. In 2016, an additional $106 million was requested. Looking ahead to this week, we have a few launches coming up. Today, Monday, November 25th, at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. GMT, a Russian Soyuz rocket will launch an unspecified payload from Plesetsk Cosmodrome. There won't be any live coverage. After having been postponed twice, Ariane Space plans to launch their Ariane 5 rocket today for realsies. The launch window extends from 4.08 to 5.51 p.m. Eastern, 9.08 to 10.51 p.m. GMT live coverage here on Ross Base. Tuesday the 26th at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 3.30 a.m. GMT on the 27th, India's space agency ISRO will launch a PSLV-XL rocket with the Cartosat-3 Earth Imaging and Mapping Satellite. There may be live coverage, so stay tuned. On Thursday the 28th at 2.56 a.m. Eastern, 7.56 GMT, in the wee hours of Thanksgiving morning where I live, Rocket Lab will launch their 10th electron rocket, appropriately named running out of fingers. On board will be the ALE-2 satellite, which will create artificial shooting stars by simulating re-entering meteor particles. Coverage here on Raw Space. I'm trying something new this week. In addition to the YouTube video, I'm also publishing this Space Week episode as a podcast, 
hosted on podomatic.com. I'm not sure where else it will be published, maybe iTunes, maybe elsewhere. I'll put links in the description. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. As always, feel free to like, subscribe, and activate notifications if you don't want to miss anything. If you appreciate content like this, you may wish to consider contributing. Merch store, Patreon, and PayPal links are in the description. See you next time.